the University of Michigan Division of Gastroenterology and the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Program host the IBD Visiting Professor Lecture Series in Ann Arbor, Michigan. This series presents the latest in clinical research and basic science from IBD experts from around the world. So we're going to cover the magnitude of the risk. We're going to talk about risk factors. Does surveillance colonoscopy work? Uh, we're going to talk about managing polypoid versus flat dysplasia, the management, uh, the natural history. This is a really a bit of a moving target, but we'll try to make some science out of it. The effectiveness of chromoendoscopy, the impact of chemopreventive agents, surveillance recommendations at the end. And at this time, uh, at the end, I'd like to share with you some of our most recent data that's going to be presented at the uh, oncology uh, plenary session on uh, distal dysplasia being a risk factor for progression to high grade and cancer. So what do we know about the, um, the overall magnitude of colon cancer risk? Now, we know that the lifetime risk of getting colorectal cancer in FAP is about 100%. With Lynch syndrome, depending upon which gene you have that's mutated, it's maybe 60 or 80%. If you have IBD, it's about 15% lifetime or so. So that makes IBD probably the third highest risk group for getting colorectal cancer, at least based on historical data. So much of our understanding of how the time course of that risk is, is shown in uh, Jane Eden's meta-analysis where, uh, as we know, you don't typically find cancers arising for the first decade of disease, but after about 10 years of disease, it starts going up. And patients look at this graph and they freak out because it looks like it's going to go up to infinity. I'm destined to get colorectal cancer. But look at the, cur look at the um, axis here. After 30 years of disease, your probability is still only about 20%. So it does go up. Uh, we used to think it was about 0.5 to 1% per year, uh, and that's what we often tell our patients. And lest you think that Crohn's disease is any less of a risk, uh, you can get an almost superimposable graph for people with Crohn's colitis. Uh, this occurs if you eliminate people who have just pure ileitis. So if you only have ileitis, your risk of colon cancer is no greater than the general population. And in fact, you have to have enough colon involved. If you have a tiny little sigmoid inflammation from Crohn's disease, that's not going to give you all that much cancer. So if you have substantial Crohn's colitis for a comparable extent as somebody with UC, your risk is thought to be about the same. So Jane Eden published her meta-analysis in 01, and you can see here uh, that at about 30 years of disease, you got an 18% risk. Subsequent to that, there were several other population-based studies that show that maybe dysplasia risk is a lot lower. In fact, you can see here from different parts of the world, even after 30 years of disease, we haven't even broken the double digits. So that was kind of sobering. Maybe the risk is not quite as high as we used to think. Uh, and then Ed Loftus pu pulled a lot of this together and also showed that the annual incidence rate, it wasn't even 0.5%. In, in many cases, it's, it was even much less than 0.5% per year. And in fact, if you look at the relative risk compared to the general population, in some studies, uh, th this it was not statistically significant. The Charles Bernstein study in Canada showed that UC, uh, UC and uh, Crohn's patients had about a two or three-fold greater risk than the general population. So we're living with data that's somewhat conflicting. Uh, what is the actual annual risk of getting colon cancer? What is the overall lifetime risk? We still feel, I think nobody would feel comfortable saying that you know, we don't have to worry about our IBD patients. They're still a high-risk group, so we have to kind of manage them at least based on historical um, data. Uh, I just would call to your attention in the back, you may not be able to see this at the bottom, but um, a technical review on this whole topic just came out in Gastro last month, in the February issue of Gastro, that Frank Ferre, Rob Odds, Jane Eden, and I co-authored. Um, it's a bit of a long document. Um, some of my colleagues at work joke that it's going to be a nice coffee table ornament, um, but nobody's going to read it because it's like 40 pages long or something. But anyway, uh, anything that I say today, if you fall asleep or have to leave, it's in that document. So the most important risk factor we feel is having disease more than uh, eight or 10 years and extent of colitis. And although this is based in large part on old barium enema data, if you've only had proctitis in the, in the extent of your disease, you're supposed to be at no greater risk than the general population. But the more colon that's involved, the greater the risk is. Of course, we know that people who have PSC, the 7 or 5% of IBD patients who have BS PSC, they're at very high risk of getting colorectal cancer. 
which is kind of curious because very often their colitis is subclinical. It's very um, indolent. Family history of colon cancer, just like in the general population, will increase your risk. And the uh, younger the individual in the family is, the higher your risk is with IBD, although, again, that's based on very little data. The, the issue of inflammation is interesting. Until just a few years ago, this had not been looked at. Now there's several studies. There's a few that have looked at histology and a couple that have looked at colonoscopy. However you measure active inflammation, that does beget a higher colon cancer risk. That doesn't mean that you have to have active, you know, hamburger meat colonic mucosa for 20 years. Uh, in fact, maybe there are people who have just a horrible onset of disease the first year or two of their colitis, and then it burns out, and lo and behold, 20 years later, they got their cancer. Uh, I should point out that one of these studies came from our group, and the person who led the study was Rupali Bansal, who was a University of Michigan medical student who spent a year with us doing a Dars Duke clinical research fellowship, so we're proud of her. Um, now, anatomical abnormalities also had not really been appreciated fully until recently, and we now know that if you have a, a diseased-looking colon, you know, we've all seen these colons, if it's foreshortened, if there's strictures, if there's pseudopolyps, not only does it make it harder to, to, to survey, but we think that, that the, each of these things is a sign that there's been a lot of inflammation in the past that has healed, and that's probably the risk factor. But clearly, dysplasia is the marker that we worry about the most because that clearly puts somebody on the path to cancer. Those are the factors that increase risk. What can lower the risk? Well, surveillance colonoscopy is really what we rely on. I'll spend a few minutes later talking about chemo prevention. The, the data is kind of mixed in that. And there's even some data to say that regular doctor visits actually lowers your risk. What it is about that doctor visit, I don't know, maybe paying the bill more frequently lowers your risk. I, I think what it is is that somebody is actually reporting symptoms a little bit more regularly, and that triggers a colonoscopy, and there you go. So we have to understand the level of evidence that this um, uh, technical review was based on. It was actually, uh, th there's no, there's no randomized studies, as you can imagine. You're not going to take a, an IBD population and say, okay, half of you are going to get colonoscopy and half of you are not, and we'll see who gets cancer. So uh, there aren't even any cohort studies. So everything is case control or decision analysis. It's piecing together data as best we can from the literature. But when we look at, the, when we look at screening colonoscopy or FOBT or sigmoidoscopy, the gold standard to say that a screening or surveillance test actually works is to say that it actually lowers mortality. You can't just say that you're finding more cancers, because if all the cancers you find are stage four, your modality is useless. You have to show that you lower mortality. Um, and we don't have that data, and this is kind of the best that we have. And Winston Churchill said, you know, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. So we live in an imperfect world when it comes to surveillance, but the one study there's really one study that has shown that surveillance colonoscopy lowers mortality. It came from Per Carlin's group in, at the Karolinska, where in a case control study design, they had 40 patients with, who died of colon cancer in UC, and they matched them to 102 controls. And believe it or not, in those days, um, people were not getting regular colonoscopies. They were getting barium enemas primarily. So if you take, compared to a group that never had colonoscopy, even having one colonoscopy in the course of your colitis, or more than one, lowered your risk of dying from colorectal cancer. Now, uh, the naysayers say, well, yeah, but that was not statistically significant. But it still looks like an impressive reduction in mortality. And we use this basically to tell patients that we think that what we do with surveillance is going to save your life. Can we lower the incidence, not just the mortality, but the incidence? Here, too, there's basically only been two studies. And I highlight them here. There's one from England, which is in white. And there's one from uh, the Mayo Clinic, which is shown here in purple. They showed almost identical things. Compared to people who never had a colonoscopy in these case control studies, those who had at least one colonoscopy significantly lowered their incidence of developing colorectal cancer. So we do believe that by doing colonoscopies, and you know, as you know, we do them every one to two years after eight or 10 years of disease, uh, we think that that actually is lowering the incidence. For all we know, Maybe those numbers I showed you earlier on, where the incidence rates have been going down, maybe those rates are reflecting the efficacy of colonoscopy or 5-ASAs or early colectomy. It's a little bit hard to say where that's all coming from. 